turn to John chapter 6. We are continuing this chapter that begins with that feeding of the 5,000, that glorious miracle. We have seen the response of the people. They were ready to make Jesus their king, to lead them in victory, to provide what is needed. And we see how Jesus challenged them and how he then continues to explain to people and to show them what is real, what is true, and how they are to hear his words. Beginning then in verse 35 of John chapter 6, I ask you would stand the sign of our respect for the word of God if you are able to. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I say that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up on the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up on the last day. Then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I give is my flesh, which is for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. The grass withers, the flower fades, the word of God endures forever. Amen. Please be seated. We read through this passage and we are not surprised that in the next verse that we will consider next week, many said, this is a hard saying, who can understand it? And as we look this morning, we want to consider Jesus' instruction, Jesus' teaching. For we do not want to be like that person who goes to school or goes to a lecture and they sit down and they begin to listen and they say, I must be in the wrong place. I don't understand anything of what is being taught. But we come seeking to know 
the truth of God. And as we consider this passage this morning, we want to think about what is being taught. We want to think about the origin of Jesus. Where does he come from? We want to think about the origin of faith, for Jesus speaks to that. And we want to think about that faith and its fulfillment. How does faith gain us eternal life? As Jesus is answering the Jews, as he is explaining to them who he is, he makes increasingly clear that he is not as they are from the earth. But he makes a claim that he is from heaven. If we look back a little earlier, there is that hint already in verse 27 where Jesus speaks of himself that there is everlasting life in him, that the Son will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. But he develops that further, and we see then in verse 33, the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And he makes that even more explicit where he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. He says in verse 38, I have come down from heaven. And you think of what a claim that is. And, and the Jews respond to that and they, they look at Jesus and they say, wait a minute, we know this guy. We know his family. We know he comes from Nazareth. How can he say he comes from heaven? We stop and think about what Jesus is claiming. That his origin is not of this world. Yes, he had a true human nature. He was born of Mary, but he came from heaven. Here is the eternal Son of God who has come into the earth and he, he takes on our flesh and blood that he might relate to us, indeed, that he might stand in our place. But he has come from heaven, a realm of perfection, of glory unimaginable to us, of power and wisdom and knowledge as light, unapproachable. And you think Jesus left that to enter a sin-filled world with his destruction and sorrow. And he did so because of his love. But you see, our understanding of where Jesus comes from is so important because if, as the Jews there thought, he is simply another man, he was making claims that were far beyond anything that he was able to make and be believed. If his origin was of this world, he could be a good teacher. He could be a wise man. But to claim that he came from heaven, from another realm, was like, saying, here, meet my friend, he's from Mars. <laughs> We'd say, no, it doesn't work. It doesn't happen. And yet Jesus says, I've come from heaven. I've come from the Father. And people have repeated the complaint of the Jews of that day again and again. With the rise of rationalism and the Enlightenment, the skeptics would say, well, we know that people have a biology. We know how they are born. We know their development. And, and therefore, for Jesus to say he came from heaven, it, it just doesn't work. And so we'll make him a wonderful teacher, a model, an example. But he was but a man, a beginning and end. And that was all that they would acknowledge. But Jesus claimed 
is for something different. I have come down from heaven. And as we come to Jesus, think of the difference that it must make in our approach to him. If he was simply another man, we can admire men. But how much can they help us? You'd say, well, they could help us in many ways, but can they save my soul? Can they give me a peace that passes understanding? Can they give me a joy inexpressible? Can they give me a hope of everlasting life? And we'd say, no. But if we think of Jesus and his claim, I've come down from heaven to do the will of my Father, to gather a people to myself, to stand in their place, to suffer the judgment of God for them. Then we come to Jesus and we say, here is one worthy of faith, a belief of trust, of obedience, But the Jews thought they knew Jesus. They put him in this category. And they complain. They murmur about Jesus' claim. And yet here, Jesus makes clear to you and to me, I have come from heaven. Yes, we can see him. He had a body that could be touched felt. But Jesus says, this is not who I am. I'm the person, Jesus Christ, having a human nature and a divine nature. I've come from heaven. And as the Jews are murmuring, complaining, Jesus says something else about not only the origin of himself, but the origin of faith. Of those who would believe in Jesus, who would trust in him. For all are called to Jesus. Jesus himself, Matthew 11, at the end of the chapter, says, Come to me, all you are weary and heavy laden. He doesn't make distinction. The invitation goes out to all people. Come to me and you will find rest. But faith that finds its hope in Jesus. Where does that come from? And our text answers that and it shows it comes from the Father. In verse 37, Jesus makes that statement all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The Father gives the Son a people. And in verse 40, there is again that reminder. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is the will of the Father who sent his Son. In verse 44, here it explicitly states, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And you think of that text and what it is saying. <laughs> there is nothing more humbling to the pride of men than this verse. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. How many people resent that and stumble over it and say, I am going to figure it out. I am going to decide. It is in my power. And Jesus says, no one can come to me 
unless the Father draws in. It is that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit that we have seen earlier in John. For Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And how easily do we read that and, and say, wait, there must be some mistake. You mean I can do nothing? It doesn't seem fair. And yet here is the teaching of Jesus. And I want to give an analogy that I, I hope will be helpful. We think of our children. And if your children are like my children when they were small, they liked sweets. They loved candy. And, and they could live off of it. Breakfast, lunch, dinner, if you let them. And... and what do we do as parents? Say, well, they like that. We'll let them choose. <laughs> we say, well, well, we'll set a nice meal here. We'll set the candy there. And guess which one they would go to? The candy. And we say, well, no, what we need to do is we need to teach them. We need to instruct them. We need to not give them the candy, but to give to them the healthy, wholesome food that will enable them to be strong, to grow. Well, all people are like that. If, if candy represents a sin, we're all drawn to it. We think this is what is going to make me happy. This is what I'm going to find my identity. We by nature go to it. And it must be the work of God to show us, no, in that sin is death, is judgment. And yes, you are drawn to it, but there must be a change. And it is God who does that change. So that we begin to see the danger in sin and to see the beauty of holiness, of righteousness in Jesus. And this is what God does. It is the work of his spirit changing people. And therefore it doesn't depend upon us. By nature, we are inclined to sin. We are dead in our sins and trespasses, Ephesians tells us. And therefore, it must be God giving life. And do we complain about it? Because we are given life? Because God in his mercy does not give us what we deserve, but because he works in us? That we might have faith in Jesus Christ? So every Christian finds great comfort. For if this is the work of God, if this is the will of God, we may rest in it and have assurance. If God has begun this work, he will bring it to completion. It doesn't depend upon me holding on to God. No, God is holding on to me. He has worked in me. He has given life. And there is a comfort to the believer. And the origin of faith is not in my weak, frail, compromised nature, but in the perfect will and power of God. And there is our comfort. And this is what Jesus then teaches. And he doesn't teach the people, try harder, be better, do more. The Pharisees had said, we've done everything. <laughs> Paul could say, as to the law, blameless. And when he was confronted by God and the standard of his holiness, he could see all he had done counted as rubbish for the sake of knowing Christ. It was the work of God in him. And Paul didn't complain and said, oh, I tried so hard, it was all for nothing. He says, thanks be to God who gives us the victory, who accomplishes that work. And this is what Jesus is teaching. He is calling, confronting them to humble them. We all must be broken before God. 
we must see our nature, that we are inclined to all sin, that our pride lifts us up. And we must be humble before God and say, Lord, it's not in me. But you have come. You have sent your son. And Jesus now says, those who come to him, he will raise up on the last day. For our faith is a gift of God, not of works. We have no boasting. But what is the fulfillment of faith? Where does it come to its perfect expression? Well, Jesus says again and again, I will raise him up on the last day. Jesus says those who believe have everlasting life. And it's easy again to say that. And, and what do we think of? We, we, we right away tend to think of, well, we're going to live a long, 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 long time. We say, well, wouldn't we get tired of it at some point? And here's where we under, need to understand. When Jesus talks about eternal life, it is life that is lived in the fullness of the presence of God. In heaven, there will never be any boredom. No one will ever complain, like our kids do sometimes. I've got nothing to do. We will see the beauty of God. We will labor in heaven forever and find it to be our perfect delight. This is the everlasting life that Jesus talks about. Not simply a, an infinite sequence of time, but a fullness of the blessing of God and being in his very presence. There is the glory. But how many people think about this? If you ask people, if you could have anything you wanted, what do you want? And how many of us ourselves even go to thinking, <laughs> if I had a house, a car, if I had a relationship, if I had all these things here and now, material possessions, saying, I, I want a good life. And how do we define that? Comfort, security, peace. And Jesus says, no, I give eternal life. I give to you the knowledge of God. I give you a way to approach an infinitely holy God and not be consumed. This is what Jesus says he gives. This is the grand design, the object of faith. And Jesus says, believe in me. But more than that, we come to this part of the passage and, and we say, no wonder the Jews were a little confused. You read these words and and Jesus says, I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. And we say, well, it's a nice image. But then Jesus says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man. <clears throat> and we go, that sounds strange. What is Jesus talking about? And drink his blood. You have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. And you think, no wonder the Jews are trouble. What do we make of that? And Jesus is using imagery here. He is building on what he has referred to before of the manna that God gave from heaven. As the Jews were in the wilderness for 40 years, God sent manna, and every morning there it was except for the Sabbath. And they would go out and they would gather it and they would eat. This was the manna that came from heaven. But Jesus reminds them twice, your fathers ate manna. Here was food from heaven. And they ate it and they're dead. 
It kept them alive for a time, but they died. Their life ended. Jesus says, even the bread, the manna from heaven, was insufficient to give people that life that was eternal. But Jesus now says, I am the bread that comes down from heaven. And he uses now a metaphor. He's using picture language that communicates something. To eat his flesh, to drink his blood. What is that communicating? That Jesus becomes a part of us. What we say today is you are what you eat. <laughs> now, you kids eat broccoli and you don't look like broccoli. You're not broccoli. But, but we understand that it becomes part of us. It is that nourishment. It is that life. And Jesus is saying, this is what you need. You need me. You don't need to know about me. You need to eat me. You need to take me into yourself. And here is that, that glorious doctrine that faith unites us to Christ. This is that reality. And verse 56 explains it. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. A union with Christ. Christ in me and I in Christ. Here is why it is expressed this way. Yes, in a sense, it, we'd say it's shocking, but Jesus wants these Jews, he wants you and me to know. It's not simply hearing Jesus, learning what he taught. He must live in us. Our life must be defined by our relationship to Jesus. This is what he is saying. And here is where that that fullness of faith comes to expression. That we say, I have life in me because Jesus is in me. Because I have received him and my faith now causes me to have that relationship, that fellowship with him. That even as I eat bread and find it gives me life. My faith feeds upon Christ and I find eternal life. And so Jesus is making radical claims. If he had not come down from heaven, who would listen to him? He would be a man making exaggerated claims. But he is the Son of God, sent by the Father, Therefore, he may make these radical claims because they are true and they are the source of life. And John wants to set before you not some weak Jesus who was overcome by the Romans and crucified but the Son of God who laid down his life, who had the power to destroy all his enemies with a word, but instead laid down his life, that you might have life as you receive him, as you eat him, as you drink him, as you are united to him. The Apostle Paul expresses it a little differently. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. He speaks of that union. And we think of how he expresses it as well, the church in Colossae. When he speaks of the gospel presenting Jesus Christ, come not only to the Jews, but to the Gentiles as well. God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is the same truth that Jesus speaks here. Of faith having its object, Jesus Christ, not intellectual knowledge, 
not doctrine, not a church organization, but Jesus Christ. Here is my hope. It is a person who has loved me and gives himself to me that I may now have that confidence, that hope that as God has worked in me now, I have Jesus Christ, I have everlasting life. And this is what Jesus sets before the crowd. Remember, they had come looking for Jesus because they'd eaten the food. <laughs> that was good yesterday. Let's see what we get today. And Jesus challenges them. You came looking for food, but you need the food that is going to give you eternal life. And Jesus says, that is me. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. And here is that glory. And this week, as we think about the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus, we think of him coming down to do the will of his Father, to provide for the forgiveness of sin, to provide the righteousness that will enable us to be in the very presence of God. And we meditate upon Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, that we may say, I have life everlasting. And I claim that promise that I will be raised by Jesus on the last day. Because that eternal life that is ours does not exempt us from death. Our bodies will die. They will be laid in the ground. But they will be raised again, glorious fitted for everlasting life in the presence of God to know the fullness of joy you see you begin to see how Jesus explaining in our text claims that origin from heaven and he says the origin of faith is that gift of my father not dependent upon frail fickle men but the eternal purposes of God and Jesus says you will find the fullness of that faith as you are united to me by faith. And therefore we rejoice that John has recorded this, that we may see our Savior, that we may understand who he is, where he has come from, that we may say my faith is in him and I am united to him. His death is my death and his life is my life there's the glory for all who believe in Jesus Christ amen let us pray Lord our God as we read of the origin of Jesus as we think of the glories of heaven that he left to come into a sin-filled world as he came knowing that the cross awaited him. O oh Lord, we pray that we may be overwhelmed by the greatness of the love of our God, that we may see that our Savior is worthy of all praise and adoration and worship, and may we hunger and thirst for him May we feast upon him by faith and find